Our controversy arises out of a question about fasting. But by the end, we'll clearly see that this isn't a question of fasting, but it's about how Jesus' coming radically alters everything. It changes everything. So one day, Levi said he was done collecting taxes for Rome. And he left his job, and he left everything that he had known, and he followed Jesus. And on that day, he threw a great feast with Jesus as the guest of honor, with many other tax collectors and sinners there. Now this is a problem. First off, Jesus is hanging around with a bunch of people who nobody likes. Tax collectors, anybody, if you're a tax collector in here, I'm sorry. Anybody love a good tax collector? (laughs) We do at St. Matthew. We love everybody. (laughs) Tax collectors, sinners, people of a bad reputation. And secondly, Jesus and his followers are feasting and not fasting while all of the scribes and the Pharisees and even John the Baptist's disciples are spending their time fasting. Now, to understand why people are so alarmed about this, specifically the religious elite, we have to understand why they fasted in the time of Jesus. Fasting is what believers did to bring their body into sync with the unpleasant and difficult realities that surrounded them. You don't feast when everything is wrong. Now, that's unless you're an American. (laughs) Right? When we're depressed, give us food, give us ice cream, give us Hulu, give us Netflix, give us TikTok, and we're going to binge it all. Right? It might even seem funny, right? We joke about it. We joke about depressed binges. Because we realize how unhealthy it is. Everything's bad, but instead of doing the work to make it better, I just eat ice cream. (laughs) But in the time of Jesus, the religious leaders took this very seriously. Fasting is what they did to bring their bodies in sync with unpleasant and difficult realities. But they didn't just fast due to their own difficulties. They fasted on behalf of the nation. Now you have to remember, at the time that Jesus is walking on this planet, they believe that there had been 400 years of silence between them and God. This is the intertestamental period, right? It's from the end of the Hebrew Bible until we start with the New Testament. In that space was 400 years. It's where we get the Apocrypha. And the belief, the kind of common frame was, is that we've been so bad that God wants nothing to do with us. God's no longer speaking. And so in order to deal with that, they said, we're going to focus on the last thing God said, and we're going to make a whole lot of rules around it. And then we're going, as religious people, to make people keep those rules so that when God is ready to speak to us again, we're okay. That we've done what we need to do. Three chapters earlier than this, we're introduced to a precious woman in the Gospel of Luke named Anna. Now, Anna was a prophetess who had been a widow for decades. And she stayed in the temple day and night, slept there, worshiping and fasting and praying, anxiously awaiting the redemption of Jerusalem. We look at that today and we may think, man, what a waste of a life. Why don't you go do something? But for her, this was doing something. She was waiting on God and anticipating that she believed that the promises of God were true. And that while the world couldn't see it, while they were busy keeping rules, her fasting wasn't about maintaining a set of rules in order to keep order. Her fasting was waiting and watching, holding fast. Well, then one day what happens? Jesus is born. 
And she gets word that the Messiah has been born. And she praises God on her hands and knees, knowing that God's promise had been fulfilled, that there was a new bridegroom who had come to set everything right. Fast forward 30 years. By the time you get to chapter 5, it was a time for God to show up in new ways. And the way that God was showing up was through this person that we know as Jesus. And God was choosing to make God's self more fully known and realized and connected and reconciling to the community. This common man from nowhere in Nazareth steps on the scene and he starts healing lame people and forgiving people of their sins and feasting with sinners and he's plucking grain and he's healing people on the Sabbath. Meanwhile, the Pharisees are fasting twice a week, Monday and Thursday of every week, to intercede for the people of Israel and beg God, their bridegroom, to return. And the disciples of John are doing the same thing. And Jesus was eating and drinking. I count eight times in Luke alone where it talks about Jesus sitting down to a meal often with people he shouldn't be having a meal with in their day and age. Later, in fact, this is such an important piece of the Gospels, that the Pharisees and the Sadducees and scribes mock him for being a glutton and a drunkard. One of my professors used to say, the reason Jesus was put on a cross was because he liked a good party. <laughs> and the religious elite didn't like a party. So, the religious elite are saying, hey, man, like, I see that you're clearly religious. I see that you have followers. I see that God is doing something in you, but why aren't you fasting? Even John, your cousin who baptized you, his disciples are fasting. So why aren't you? And Jesus' reply is simple and confusing. <laughs> Can you make the wedding guest fast? while the bridegroom is with them? Now, has anyone ever been to a wedding where you were told to stay away from the food? <laughs> no way, right? Weddings are a time of rejoicing and celebrating the couple. So Jesus here in this simple statement, when the bridegroom's here, you feast is making a massive claim about God and himself. He's saying, the one you've been waiting for these last 400 years, the one you feel like has been silent for ages, is here. Why, in fact, am I feasting? The better question is, why are you fasting? Jesus is constantly challenging religious practices gone stale. Their original meaning had long been forgotten, and now we're simply public ritual. And he's warning them, like in Matthew 6, 1, beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. Right? So they had gone on this journey for a really important reason— Right? These religious leaders weren't trying to be uh, stodgy, boring church people. Right? They were actually living out their faith over 400 years that had been handed down to them, that had been handed down to the next generation. Imagine four, six, eight generations of religious leaders handing down, you have to do this thing because if we don't, we might miss God and we don't want to miss God. And so let's just build rules, build rules on top of rules on top of rules, and let's create these boundaries of what is clean and unclean. Let's set up all of these systems so that when God comes, we're ready for him. They're so ready for him that they can't see him when he's right in front of their face. Right? Because 
Fasting has become their God. The rules have become their God. The systems have become their God. And they're keeping all of that in order and they're missing Jesus in front of them. So on that day, he's confronted with this questioning of fasting. And the disciples of John the Baptist and the Pharisees all fasted. And Jesus took this opportunity to speak about what it really means to change from a consciousness of living by public ritual to a consciousness of authentic spiritual relationship. Now, Jesus wants to make sure they understand the point. And so we get these two stories, one about fabric and one about wine. I chose wine. <laughs> no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins and the wine is lost. So are the skins. But one puts new wine into new wineskins. See, fasting isn't the issue. The old wine isn't the issue. How many of us like old wine? I love a good bottle of old wine. Right? Fasting's not the problem. It's how they're using the fasting that's become the problem. Jesus, don't hear this as saying that Jesus is saying old wine is bad. He's not. And new wine is good. He's not. He's saying don't miss the forest for the trees. Don't miss it. This comparison is a very apt when we think about the properties of wine and wineskin. I almost know that name right. When wine is new, it's in a state of fermentation. It bubbles and expands as the fermentation gases are released. A fresh, pliable wineskin can absorb such expansion and it slowly ages with the wine until the fermentation process is complete. You put new wine in an old wineskin and you're asking for trouble. Because the old wineskin has already taken the shape of a new wine that's been transformed into an old wine. And instead of being pliable, now it's brittle. And the activity of the new wine will stress it beyond its ability, and you will lose both the wine and the wineskin. And that's bad, my friends. What's the point? We can't put new ideas into old mindsets. We can't get new results with old behaviors, right? Our lives are what they are because the systems we've created in them. To the things that have happened to us, to the way that we've adjusted to that, to all of the ways that we've manifest to get us where we are. I'm 45 in a few weeks, and in that place, I am fully who I am based on all the things that have happened to me and how I've adjusted to them throughout time. Without making some conscious changes, everything's going to be the same when I'm 55 and standing up here, God willing. Not the same part, the standing up here, God willing. <laughs> right? So one example for the most common resolution, the one that gets broken the most often, has to do with weight control. What most, often, what most of us fail to do is to address the permanent changes needed of eating right and exercising. So trying to put the new wineskin of a trimmer body into an old wineskin of established, ingrained, poor eating habits will not bring lasting results. Right? I have to change my habits. Habits unchecked are stronger than conscious willpower every time. Hear that. The habits we've ingrained in ourselves over the course of our life are stronger than the conscious willpower that we have in any given moment every time. Only when we fully understand what's really going on at the level of unconscious behavior can we take control and bring willpower to bear. So the religious leaders who are there and they have these patterns and these systems that have been built into their being for generation upon generation upon generation. Jesus is saying, in order for all of that to shift, you need change. You have to change the way you're thinking. So I think there's three ways that we can go about this change that Jesus is talking about, and they're going to be ours so that you can remember them today. Number one is repent. Repent. I don't know about you, that word freaks me out a little bit. Repent simply means, actually the word metanoia that's translated into repent, 
simply means to change your mind. Right? The religious leaders of the time of Jesus needed to change their mind. They needed to understand that the person in front of them was the person they had been waiting for their entire life. Right? Repent means so much more than being conscious stricken or contrite. It's changing our ways. It's changing. It's shifting a paradigm. The Apostle Paul grasped this well, and he said to his friends in Rome, don't be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And in Philippians, he says, let the same mind be in you that is in Christ Jesus. See, the way that Jesus saw the world was crucial to understanding and living in the new paradigm and the new wineskin. So they are holding this old paradigm, and Jesus is saying, you're waiting for a bride, but the bride is here, ready to live into what is to come. Everything you've been waiting for, preparing for, all of that is right here. You have to change your mind, and then all of that other stuff may begin to make sense or not make sense based on what you're actually Perceiving of the presence of Christ being in your space. See, the essence of repentance is letting go of old, limited ideas and investing our belief in new and expansive ideas. So first, we've got to be willing to have a mind shift. The second thing we have to do is replace. You have to replace new thoughts, old thoughts with new thoughts. How many of you have constant tapes or CDs or records, however old you are, inside your head playing over and over and over? You get up in the morning and you start thinking this about yourself. You start thinking this about your job. You start thinking this about your faith. You start thinking, uh, you know, you name all these things. They're just tapes that, and some of these tapes you didn't buy yourself. They were handed to you, right? Right? For years, my dad said, if you're not early, you're late. It's a tape. So for years, I would just be late just to tick off that old tape. <laughs> right? But that's part, like we have these tapes that have been handed to us. They play and they play and they play in our head. Some of us, in order to move through the metanoia into a new way of life, have to replace the old tapes with some new digital downloads. We have to be able to challenge the old things that we've understood about God and our faith and our work and our behaviors and replace old patterns with new ones and use them not as temporary measures but as permanent changes. Like over time, by replacing these tapes, by paying attention, right? So what could the... uh, religious leaders of the day done differently. Well, instead of complaining, they could have sat down at the table. Right? Instead of standing outside of this feast that's happening, they could have said, hey, I don't really understand why you're feasting, but do you mind if I join you so that I can? Do you mind if I sit here for a while and eat with you? That clearly something's going on. Something's going on enough that I'm uncomfortable that Jesus is doing something new and meaningful and powerful. I'm so uncomfortable with that that all I can do is complain. But instead of complaining about the tapes that I've received, how about I open myself up to maybe somebody else has a deeper understanding than I do of what's going on? And sit down and have the meal and have a conversation with Jesus and to begin to understand what he's talking about when he's talking about a bridegroom? What does he mean that the presence of God is here and with us? And, and beyond all that, like, how is he actually healing people and forgiving sins? When you say you forgive sins, Jesus, what do you mean by that? I'm not asking that in judgment. Like, I'm asking that because I really want to understand what you mean when you forgive sins. See, sometimes replacing the old tapes to see the new mindset requires us to behave outside of what we normally would, to challenge our ways of being. Now, the third thing I think that's really important about all this is I think we need to relax. (laughs) 
right? We just need to relax. We are so uptight about all of these things. We're like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. We're holding things so tight that we might do something wrong that God forbid that God wouldn't love us because we did this thing. We already know that's not true, right? In the core of our being, we know that's not true. We just don't believe it in practice. So we have to start living like we believe it, right? If, if grace is true, then I'm covered and I can sit down and I can have a feast. I don't have to keep living into the same patterns and rhythms that have been happening over and over in my life, producing results that I don't actually like. But instead, I can just take a deep breath and say, all right, the bridegroom's here. The bridegroom has me. The Spirit of God is upon us. The same power that resurrected Jesus Christ courses through our veins. And that same power and love that rose Jesus from the dead is the same power that rises us every morning. And so I can just take a deep breath and believe that grace is true enough and that God has got me. Because change takes time. It took me 45 years to get as messed up as I am today. Whether you like it or not, church, it's going to take 45 years for me to become something different. And that's the journey that I'm on with Jesus, and that's the journey you're on with Jesus, and that's what we're doing together, and that's as a community the journey we're on, and as a nation, and as a world, and as a kingdom of God, that's what we're on this journey doing together. And we all just need to relax and give each other some grace. Because the presence of Christ is among us. God is with us. The incarnate Christ has pinched, pitched his tent in our neighborhood. Amen? Amen? Please pray with me. Gracious God, thank you for sending us the new wine of your Holy Spirit, for making us your new wineskin through our Lord Jesus Christ. Fill us with your Holy Spirit today. Help us to take off the old people that we are and put on the new person of Jesus Christ that he may live in us. I know that you have been offering your grace to us thousands of times each day and that we've ignored it or refused it or been incapable of seeing it because the other stupid tapes playing in our head. Help us to see you and accept you however you choose to come to us today. May we be surprised by your presence. 